From bureaus worldwide, this is FSN. Yeah, thanks very much, Ollie Barrett. Welcome to Tuesday's Richie Allen Show. The time is approaching three minutes past the hour. It is indeed. It is the 15th of October 2019. I am, of course, Richie Allen. I've got two terrific guests lined up for you this programme. You don't want to miss it, by the way. We're live on Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, TriggerWarning.tv, my website, multiple platforms around the world, Europe's most listened to independent radio show. Great to be with you. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Yeah, I think I said that. Let's get on with it then. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, a very good friend of mine joins the program in the second hour. Francis Leader returns to the program. Great environmental campaigner, activist, was uh, educating people about fracking when most people never heard or didn't know anything about fracking. Terrific lady. We'll get into lots with her in the second hour. We'll get into fracking, of course. What's happening with it? Is it over? Is fracking dead in the UK? And we'll also talk about Extinction Rebellion. It's uh, possible that the protest has come to an end today. What's really going on with that? Francis Leader in the second hour. Before that, though, in hour one, I welcome to the programme for the first time Caroline Stephens. Caroline is a former UKIP candidate, former campaign coordinator for UKIP. She worked with Leave.eu financial consultant, teacher, and has got her own YouTube channel now where she interviews people and blogs or vlogs on uh, some of the issues that we'll be talking about, the European Union and where it's all meant to go. Caroline Stevens joins the programme this hour. And of course, you can join in. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's the Twitter handle. So do tweet me. I'd love to hear from you today. How you doing? Nice old day today. A bit grey, but nice. Not so much rain around. We, we like that. You can do things. You can do stuff, you see, when it's not raining. And let's go straight to the headlines because I want to, to get as much time with my guests as possible today. Here's one for you. We talk about this. Hate crimes recorded by the police are up by 10%. Oi, oi, you say. Hate crimes, 10% increase in England and Wales. This is because of recording by police. There were 10, no there weren't, there were 103,379 offences in 2018 to 2019. That's a record number, according to the Home Office. What's going on? What is going on? Transgender hate crime went up 37%, while for offences motivated by sexual orientation, the rise was 25%. Disability hate crimes, which we talked about last week, went up by 14%. And religious hate crimes only by 3%. We don't hate religion as much as we thought we did. Race hate crimes accounted for around three quarters of offences and rose by 11% on the previous year. Listen carefully. Over half, 54%, of the hate crimes recorded by the police were for public order offences. Keep that in mind. A further third were for violence against the person offences. 5% were recorded as criminal damage and arson offences. Hate crime. Give you a quick overview. This is really important stuff because it kind of, well, it shows clearly where we're headed and where freedom of thought, freedom of expression and freedom of speech is headed in the future. When hate crime was first mooted many moons ago, it meant an existing crime on the statute books. Take take a, take assault, for example. Okay? An existing crime on the statute books. Take assault. But assault aggravated by the perpetrator's prejudice against the victim's ethnicity, sexuality or religion. Right? Determined by the prosecutor or the DPP. Now, I didn't like that, but I understood it. Because it was helpful in proving culpability. Like Mr. Murphy has a habit of saying things or throwing things, things even, or being nasty to black people. He's got a history. You see, we can show you. So when he punched Mr. Smith, the black man in the face, we can prove it was aggravated by his hatred for black people. 
I understood that. Important, but it's changed in the last couple of years. It's come to be defined as an offence which the victim considers to be driven by hostility towards their race, religion, sexual orientation, disability or transgender identity. So the victim determines, yes, I got a punch in the face off of Mr. Murphy and he did it because I am X, Y, Z or whatever. It can include verbal abuse, intimidation, threats, harassment, assault, bullying and damage to property. That verbal abuse stuff isn't good because that's what constitutes most of the phone calls the police are getting. The police are soliciting members of the public to phone them when somebody calls them some names. This is true. Many of these new incidents, which account for the rise in so-called hate crime, are verbal. They're spontaneous. They're over in a flash. A mouthpiece says something a bit nasty to somebody, but then moves on. Our soul, right? And the person whom was spoken to in terms they found offensive then calls the police because the police are soliciting these calls. Am I really the last man standing in UK media who's asking questions about this? This is crazy stuff. Joe Cox's sister, she was the Labour MP, murdered just before the referendum in 2016. Her sister is a woman called Kim Leadbeater. She was on the BBC this afternoon with Simon McCoy talking about this. And Simon McCoy does ask a good question at the outset. I just wonder, does this illustrate better uh, powers of recording or the fact that the country right now is a pretty angry place? I think it's potentially a bit of both. Um, I mean, I think the fact that incidents are being recorded more readily is, is a really positive thing, uh, but that doesn't detract from the fact that there's still clearly a problem uh, with the number of attacks and incidences of hate crime that we're seeing across the country. We've seen in the last few weeks a lot of discussion about the type of language that's used, principally in Parliament, but also elsewhere. Does that play a part here? I think it does, yes. I mean, we're working very hard through through Joe's foundation, the Joe Cox Foundation, to try and tackle some of the issues that we're facing as a society. And, and the way that I think we have to do that is a, a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And I think what we need is leadership from politicians and others in the public eye to conduct themselves in a respectful and civilised manner. And I think what we also need to do is to look at communities and look at the issues that some of our communities are facing and to understand where anger and frustration is coming from and try and join up the two. Uh, so our call to action today for the main political parties was to sign up to a standard of conduct uh, for all politicians and members of parties to sign up to. Um, so that's one thing that we're doing. And as I say, a lot of the work that we do through Joe's Foundation is also at a grassroots level, looking at communities and looking at the issues that they face and trying to bring, bring people together through the, the great get together campaign, which I think can easily be dismissed as something around just getting together and having a nice time, which it certainly is. But it's actually about much more than that. It's about bringing people together across lines of difference so we understand understand disability and we understand race and we understand LGBT issues. Um, so, so these are they're important issues and, and, and they're big jobs, but um, through Joe's Foundation, we're not shying away from this work. Thought crimes. It's about thought crimes. I'm not being disingenuous. It's thought crimes. It's not good and it's unrelenting. We'll leave that for now. Well, kind of leave it because the president of the Bulgarian football union, Borislav Mihailov, has resigned today. The Bulgarian prime minister, Boyko Borisov, called for him to resign today after the racist abuse of England players in the European Championship game in Sofia last night. England won the game 6-0. It was stopped twice because of racist behaviour by home fans, which included Nazi salutes and monkey chants. The Bulgarian Football Union said the move is a consequence of the recent tensions, but in the statement made today, they didn't mention racism at all, which is, well... It's caused meltdown amongst many campaigners like these kick it out, let's kick it out, these race anti-racism campaigners. You know my thoughts on this? I'm wide open to criticism, I don't mind. And maybe the next time we do a phone-in, we will include this subject because it seems to really get your goat. Some of our listeners think I might be onto something. Others, you think that I'm a bastard. Because I say I don't believe there's any escalation in racism. I don't believe there's any evidence that racism is on the rise in the UK. I don't see it. And I don't see what happened last night was evidence of an overriding problem of racism. But I talked a lot about it this morning on the old show, so on the paper show, so I won't get into it. 
But the coverage of it today, international incident, unbelievable, unbelievable. There's no end to it all day long on UK television and radio. Everybody and their grandmother has been dragged out to say that, well, they were disgusted, they were shocked and appalled. <laughs> and I will repeat just one thing that I said this morning. For two weeks before the game, Bulgaria's fans have been called racist. For two weeks before the game, and they were warned that if they act racistly, I've coined that, that's my word, racistly, if you act racistly, or if you behave like a racist, the England players would walk off. They were told for two weeks. And guess what? It looks like a few fans got to together and coordinated, coordinated a little demonstration of racism. A tiny section behaved like idiots, coordinated maybe based on the, char the characterization of Bulgaria by the media as racist prior to the game, maybe, maybe, but it's mental. And politicians saw a gold rush opportunity today. They saw an open goal situation today. Politicians love it, don't they? The opportunity to show the world how wonderful they are. How beautiful they are and how unracist they are. So we've got a bit of virtue signaling countdown for you. It's been a while since we've done it. Do you want to hear a bit of virtue signaling countdown? Do you, do you, do you? You don't? Well, we're going to have it anyway. I've got four examples. We've got the top four today of the uh, UK virtue signaling top four countdown brought to you exclusively by the Richie Allen Show. Politicians taking, exam taking the opportunity to make hay while the sun shines, while we're all talking about racism. Oh, this is beautiful. Let's have Dr. Rosina Allen Khan. She's the shadow sports minister. She's shocked and appalled at number four about the racism. The entire country will be proud of the England team last night. Yes. And Gareth Southgate has shown true leadership in defence of his players. Brilliant. No one should have to arrive at work to be subjected to any form of discrimination. Why are our players still being subjected to this? Why? Why? In future, if players decide to walk off the pitch in protest, they must have the full support of this house, our press, and football bodies. Yes, number four, Dr. Rosena Allen Khan, Labour. At number three, at number three, SNP, Scottish National Party Member of Parliament, Gavin Newlands. So disgusted was Gavin at the abuse, he ended up supporting England. Yes, a jock supporting England, Gavin Newlands, at number three. This is a, a deeply serious issue, but. I think it would be fair to say um, that it's been some while, indeed I think it uh, perhaps uh, entirely likely I've never wanted the England football team to win and to win so well until last night and I'm, I'm delighted they did their, their talking um, on the pitch but of course they should have the right to walk off the pitch in these circumstances if they so choose. Beautiful number three. Number three, Gavin Newland from the Scottish National Party. How can you top that, you ask? Well, number two, Damien Collins is the chairman of the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee. He wants to make sure that we don't forget the gays and all of this. Let's not forget the gays. Damien Collins. Would the minister agree with me that we should also look at the forthcoming government proposals to legislate on online harms as an opportunity to look at the vile racist abuse many footballers receive on social media in this country uh, that is a growing problem and also we should look again at the status of homophobic abuse in sports stadium in this country yes too, which have been concerns about uh, the increase of that and that we should look again at the football offenses act and make homophobic abuse uh, illegal in the same way that racist abuse is illegal so both have the same status in law brilliant by damien collins sending a signal out to the gays i'm looking after your six i'm looking after your six damien collins there well, there can only be one number one today. The top of the poppermost, the top of the poppermost, uh, the most brilliant bit of virtue signalling of the day. Would you believe it? It's the speaker himself, John Burko. John Burko. Just before I call the shadow 
Minister, as I have a sense that this matter will unite the House, I would like to thank the Minister for what he's said and to say from the Chair what I think will be the feeling of colleagues. Gareth Southgate again has shown what a magnificent ambassador yes. for England and indeed the UK he is and how magnificently also the team behaved in circumstances of intense provocation intense. and vile behaviour by so-called fans. They conducted themselves with extraordinary dignity. One That's of my own children was watching the match the and children. came in to say how visibly shocked and upset he was. And, and I think the minister's reaction is one I have a sense that will be shared right across the yeah. house and by millions of people across the country. Yeah. Fantastic John Ber Berko even. Number one, the top of the Pops Virtue signaling countdown. It's John Berko today. It's time to play the music. Muppets. Muppets indeed. It's 19 minutes past the hour. Tweet the program. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That is my Twitter handle. Indeed. A quick final story before we move on. Quick final story before we move on. This is very pertinent to what's happening in Syria. The United Kingdom, announced by the BBC today, will continue selling arms to Turkey, but will not grant new export licenses for weapons which might be used in military operations in Syria, the foreign secretary has said. This is a wonderful, wonderful smattering of bullshit by Dominic Raab. Speaking to the House of Commons today, Raab said, he said, I'll tell you, we won't, um, we, 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 we will continue uh, selling arms to Turkey, but we won't give any new export licenses for weapons which might be used in military operations in Syria. What do you think the arms that you are selling to Turkey, where do you think they're going, Dominic? No mention of Yemen. At least I didn't see any, of course, in the House of Commons today. Uh, the Turks have gone to work in Syria. The Syrian army, the government has gotten involved on the side of the Kurds. I said this to Stephen Lenman over a week ago. This could become a shit show in Syria. It, not that it hasn't been already for years, of course. We're going to watch this one closely. It's uh, 21 minutes past the hour. 21 minutes past the hour. This is your Richie Allen show. Going to say hi to Caroline Stevens in a moment. Uh, she's in Yorkshire. Former UKIP parliamentary candidate. Former campaigns manager. She's a financial advisor. Teacher. Activist as well. She's got a very interesting YouTube channel. We'll get Caroline on and we'll talk about what's happening this week. As we, we are told that there should be some deal agreed in principle between the European Union and the UK tonight ahead of this week's European Union summit. It's supposedly all got to be done and dusted by tonight so that it can be discussed at the summit and can be put to the House of Commons on Saturday. What's going on? Well, Caroline Stevens has got a pretty strong opinion, so we'll get Caroline Stevens on the show right now. Uh, this is your Richie Allen Show. We are live in Salford in Greater Manchester. Always brilliant to be with you. My name is Richie Allen. This is Blur. Song called There's No Other Way. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter, by the way. There's No Other Way from Blur on the Richie Allen Show. 24 and a half minutes past the hour it is. Welcome to the programme if you're just joining it. Very big week this. I say that though with a heavy heart. Because I've been saying since, well, the 24th of June 2016 that I do not believe the United Kingdom will ever properly leave the European Union. It's being reported today that there is a narrow path of opportunity to a Brexit deal this week. But what sort of a deal? Will it be a good deal or will it be Brexit in name only? The European Union chief negotiator Michel Barnier said it was time to turn good intentions into legal text if uh, EU leaders were to back the terms of the UK's exit at a summit on Thursday. So here's how it's supposed to go. Stephen Barclay, Brexit Secretary, meeting with these people today. Today, they're supposed to have the legal text for the framework of a deal agreed. That's between the EU, 
uh, negotiators and the UK negotiators. Next step is at the summit on Thursday and Friday, they've got to try and get it past the European Union members, the 26 or the 27, right? If that works, they go to Parliament on Saturday and they put it to the House of Commons. What's going to happen? Let's welcome to the programme a very interesting lady indeed, former UKIP candidate, parliamentary candidate, campaign coordinator, has worked for Leave.eu. She's a financial consultant, has been a teacher, and she is an activist, and she's got a YouTube channel, which I do recommend you check out. If you're on YouTube, look for Caroline Stephens Seeking the Truth. Caroline Stephens Seeking the Truth, and that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. Very important to be talking about this now. Let's welcome to the programme from Yorkshire today, Caroline Stevens. Caroline, are you there? Welcome. Hi, thank you. This modern technology just doesn't work. I don't know. I think they're watching me. I think I'm going to get paranoid at this rate. Listen, you, absolutely. You're going to start wearing sunglasses and a dark hat or something as you move about Yorkshire there. Listen, gremlins, we're used to gremlins on live radio. Caroline, thanks for coming on. I've mentioned the YouTube channel and I'll tweet a link out to it um, for people who haven't um, come across it before. I'll do that shortly. The I mentioned while... Please hold. What's going on today? What is going on? <laughs> this is rather strange. Please. Are you there, Richie? I'm there now. I'm there now. Fourth time looking. Please rookie. hold. I don't know what's going on here. I'm just going to give it up. What do you reckon? Shall I give it up? <laughs> give up the job. Just give up radio. Mother of God, what's going on? Let's try that again. <laughs> Lovely jubbly. I've said it before and I'll say it again. These are the things that terrify or terrorise inexperienced radio presenters. When you first start in the job, panic stations when things nice. go on. Uh, we're live now, I think. I hope we don't get oh, cut off brilliant. again. Well, what happened was, when I was speaking to you there, I was put on hold inadvertently. I don't know what that is. But anyway, let's hope we have put the gremlins behind us. Caroline, the 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 noises coming from London and from Brussels are that some agreement might be reached later on. That will then be put to European Union member states at the summit on Thursday and Friday. If it is agreed there, it'll then be put to the House of Commons in a special sitting on Saturday. But there is a lot of concern by people like MPs from the European Research Group, um, kind of hardline Brexiteers, that Boris Johnson, in order to get some agreement with the European Union, is giving a lot away to the point that his deal might look very, very like the deal that Theresa May failed with four times. And May's deal, of course, was Brexit in name only. How do you read what's been happening? Well, to Jacob Rees-Mogg, it's just interesting to see. I mean, I'm singling out a particular politician there. Jacob Rees-Mogg had said, oh, two years ago, that we would become a, a vassal state. We would have taxation without representation. It would be a brino, Brexit in name only. But, but we've accepted all the EU legislation since we voted, you know, and we've just kept letting people in to, um, on our shores and we're signing lots of deals behind closed doors. So I'd heard, oh, must have been over two years ago, three years ago, in fact, that we were planning to give away our military to Brussels. So I, uh, two years ago, when, when it was really firming up, I started issuing leaflets and going outside barracks, would you believe, and talking to soldiers, the rank and file, and they thought I was mad. But of course, now we've had somebody um, in, in, involved in the military campaign on Facebook, and he's now finally said, it looks like we're giving away our military to Brussels. And, and the military actually guarded Theresa May. They have to. And, the, you know, this is an unsubstantiated comment here. But what was passed back to me two years ago was that Theresa May actually wanted to, was prepared to give away our military for access to the single market. Now, I can't substantiate that, but that is... That has always been at the back of my mind. And one of the MPs for Brexit said at a Christmas function two years ago to a friend of mine, she said that he said to her, he said, you know, they're not preparing in Whitehall for leaving the European Union. And that was two years ago. So this is just a pantomime because since in the intervening period, since we um, voted 
uh, 17.4 million people voted to leave, we realise that the Lisbon Treaty is is coming closer and closer until full uh, full fruition, if you like. So there's been, uh, as you probably know, I've done a few videos on Lisbon Treaty. And my goodness, was I shot at. This is where you speak the truth. And, uh, you know, I've, I've even seen the Lisbon Treaty book, read some of the pages. And, and you can be forgiven. You need to have um, an honours degree in linguistics to actually be able to understand the, uh, you know, the Lisbon Treaty. Yeah, and that was something that was put through our parliament and that was after shenanigans with uh, people in the House of Lords who actually had a foot in both the House of Lords and the European Parliament itself. So that is treason. That has to be treason. We were taken in without a mandate. Ted Heath was the guy who, you know, I'm, 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 I'm teaching. I'm, I'm sure I'm teaching a, a grandmother to suck eggs, but I don't know what your audience, uh, you know, is it a worldwide audience? Because perhaps. They think we were taken in with a mandate, but we were actually taken we're in uh, despite Ted Heath being warned it goes against our constitution. We cannot be governed by any foreign prince, prelate or power. Uh, that's, that's our constitution, the Bill of Rights 1689. So, you know, there's, there's all these groups on Facebook and uh, social media. I mean, I was looking at one that uh, a tweet from the Veterans for Britain today, and they've probably done more uh, plus myself and a few others to uh, highlight uh, the uh, military unification than anybody else. But even they put a tweet up saying, uh, which, which party has done more to cover military unification? So when you talk about political parties, it's all divide and conquer. And it's just about, look, I've had enough. I'm a woman and I'm fed up with these boys playing silly childhood little playground games and splitting all the people up you know it's about time we came to come together because there is strength in unity and i saw that in Jewsbury on saturday i know you saw uh, the article from uh, the was it the huddersfield examiner, the examiner yeah. and you know it's, it's easy for people who live i just come back from a very affluent part of devon and uh, then i gone from there to Jewsbury, and i mean the two places could not be more extreme um, in demographic makeup and uh, affluence than perhaps just about anywhere else in the country. And it just, it actually just, it hit home because that's the part of the country that I actually came from. And there was an awful lot of people that left and have traveled south and west because they do want to escape. And what is so wrong with people being able to say, I left because? And, you know, yes, it's not just the European Union, not just our membership of the EEC, but flipping heck, you know, our life has, has, has changed for the worse since we joined. I mean, look at the fishing industry. Decimated. And, Decimated, uh, you know, yeah. agriculture. We've, you know, Decimated. did you know, and this is something I only knew, uh, learned about a couple of days ago, that those farmers after, I think it was World War II, those farmers who refused to put chemicals on their soil were made bankrupt. So we've had, so all our people, you know, the fishing industry, they had to scrap their own boats. They were taken to Denmark to be scrapped. And then the ships uh, that remains were sent off to um, the Far East. And they must think we're absolutely crazy. Let me um, jump back to a very important comment you made a few seconds ago. You talked about the Lisbon Treaty, which was ratified without a referendum in the United Kingdom, as you correctly said, it was ratified in Ireland after two referenda when it was basically rejected by the Irish people first time around and the European Union insisted that the Irish government put it back to the people and they did and the people uh, fed up of it basically, many of them didn't turn out second time round and it was ratified. I want to point out this, you talk about military alignment. Now, if you listen to LBC Radio, if you listen to the BBC, if you listen to or if you read a website called Fact Check, all of those organisations claim that the idea that Britain will be forced to join a European army is a conspiracy theory. They say that repeatedly. They say that British troops, in fact, the UK Defence Journal 
wrote an article last week saying British troops will not join EU ar- army. This is wrong. James O'Brien, LBC, this is wrong. Now, I believe you're right. Um, te- well, explain to our listeners. You there, be- Go ahead. the EU army, I do wonder if we are being set up to fail because it's actually, there will be people on our side that will say it's actually EU military unification. Now, let me just give you an example. And this is a treaty that nobody, absolutely nobody will talk about. And this is a treaty that we signed with Theresa May uh, and Macron on the 18th of January 2018. So that is a treaty between, between the UK and France. And it's about Calais, it's about our borders, but it's also about military intervention in Africa. But nobody will talk about it. So the thing is, we and France are the only two nuclear powers in the whole of the EU. So if we are going to be spot welded to France, just because we might not have signed this thing called a PESCO document, it doesn't mean to say that we're not uh, in, the, in the thick of things, if you like. So we are being led into, we even lent them helicopters uh, to clear out places like Mali. Uh, so you then fast forward for four months on. And, you know, bearing in mind, this was last year, we had uh, well and truly said we're do, dumping the European Union. So four months on, we all sign a declaration in sorry, twelve. It was in December actually. The Marrakesh Declaration. So we signed that in Marrakesh Declaration, and that allows unlimited immigration into the UK and Europe from North, West, and East Africa. So you've got to just join up the dots a little bit and think well. Hey, by the way, Caroline, by the way, yeah, by the way, I just want to endorse what you said about that PESCO uh, document. This is back in, oh God, um, as you said, back in the spring or the late winter of last year, the UK was one of nine states in Europe that signed off on this joint military intervention force that Caroline described there. And it wouldn't have gotten much coverage in the UK Television media, anyway, did get some coverage in the press, but it didn't get very much coverage on television or radio. But you're quite right. That flies in the face of the Defence Ministry's claim Absolutely. that we won't that be... Tesco document. Yeah. What happened was, I yeah. went to a, a military event with Colonel Kemp and Richard Colonel, uh, Colonel Richard Kemp and uh, Sir Julian Thompson from the Falklands. And they were at this event at Manchester Tory Party Conference, a fringe event. And this was the beginning of October 2017. And Julian Thompson was brave enough to say, I don't, you know, one current and Richard did as well. They were both talking about these documents that were being brought out of the vault by civil servants, presented to MPs. Nobody knew anything about the military anymore in um in, in Parliament, and they, they, they saw the MPs signing all these documents. Then a couple of weeks later, Veterans for Britain put a tweet out about PESCO. So I went, to, I basically organised a PESCO gate campaign. I had a 1,000 people on a mailing list, and I asked, I produced a template letter, and I, we put them, all my contacts wrote to their local MP, a friend of mine, Carol Hellier, on Facebook, she basically, um, she wrote to lots of MPs like I did, and we wanted to see what the response was. But what's really interesting was that one of the people, uh, so we were basically asking the MPs, putting them on notice, we believe there's going to be military unification. For a few, They were taken um, on the back foot. They didn't expect this. But then, you know, the elite establishment, uh, wheels in motion start grinding back into place. And we were then starting to get a standard uh, letter back from the MPs. So we collated them, we named them, chained them on uh, social media. All our MPs were alerted two years ago this month to the fact of PESCO. And apparently, because we launched that campaign, One of the politicians spoke to a colleague of mine and he said to her, 
the only reason why they didn't sign the PESCO document was because of the PESCO gate campaign. Now, again, that's anecdotal, but it just shows and it's that's important. coincided with Michael Fallon being um, you the, know, the knee touching yeah. incident, if you remember. So he was shunted shunted out of uh, the equation for the time being. And then in moved, I think, Gavin Williamson, wasn't it? Gavin Williamson came in next. This is really important. This this is the permanent structured cooperation or PESCO. It's part of the EU's defence policy. And it was ratified or signed. The signatories are pretty much every country in Europe. But the official line is, and to be fair to you, Caroline, you've absolutely nailed it. You've described it perfectly. Is that the UK isn't uh, officially uh, a member and did withdraw because of our supposed exit from the European Union. However, they left it wide open that even if the UK was outside the European Union, it could participate in the future, so-called third state participation in the future. L- let me ask you this, Caroline. Caroline Stephens is our guest uh, this hour. She's in Yorkshire and uh, Caroline is up there uh, caring for somebody at the moment but took the time out to speak to us. Former UK parliamentary candidate, former campaigns coordinator, has worked for Leave.eu, has made some very interesting speeches at Leave.eu events and you can find her on YouTube, Caroline Stephens Seeking the Truth. I say Stephens because it's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S as opposed to Stephens. Good to have you on the programme. Do you believe that Boris Johnson, Jacob Reese mogg now Mogg I mean, some Conservative Party MPs must want to murder Mogg. Maybe I shouldn't use that language because what he, you said it yourself earlier on, what he refused to back Theresa May on, it looks like he might back Boris Johnson on now, some sort of horrible Brexit deal which would leave us worse off. Do you think this particular group of politicians, um, we named them Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, of course, do you believe they really want to properly leave the European Union, fully leave? What do you think? <laughs> Not at all. You remember, I, I liken it to the end of World War One, and you had the two uh, banksters, one uh, on one side of the table, one Rothschild on one side of the table, and his brother on the other side of the table. And you've got these people in politics who have basically, they've had hundreds of years to get the right people in place into Parliament. And, uh, you know, the the debates are are puerile. In fact, there are no debates these days anyway. So they're, they're basically, they must be lording it over us because they're just arranging everything at the, you know, they're just puppets. So it doesn't matter whether they're for Brexit or not. It's they're still going to win it, benefit personally. They've all got stocks and shares here and there and everywhere. They receive substantial amounts of funding for making two-hour speeches, and they get away with absolute murder. And of course, the more that they um, get up to, the more that they can be blackmailed on. And that's a very important point because you know, with the Ted Heath saga. We had Tim Fortescue, uh, the famous Tim Fortescue, who was in charge of the Whips office. And, uh, you know, if if somebody from um, one of the MPs had got into trouble and he was maybe not wanting to vote with the government, Tim Fortescue would basically open his drawer up and say, do you want this news to be leaked or, uh, or are you going to vote with the government? And I think that, uh, you know, these people are chosen. They're not chosen by the people. And that's you know, having gone through a parliamentary process myself, though uh, certainly the well, I just to draw a veil over that. Hey, let me let me let me mention something that's very important as well. Speaking about this, I'm going to use the word corruption. I might get into trouble, but I'm going to use it anyway. Caroline's MP um, was or is was no, I was, think yeah. was was. Uh, married, he he still is married, but he used to be an MP, is married to the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Joe Swinson. And we understand that he runs a company called Transparency International. And we understand that that company is funded to the tune of £3.5 million by the European Union. And I understand as well, correct me if I'm wrong, but Joe Swinson hasn't declared this to the relative authority in uh, the House of Commons. Am I right? Something did along say, those what lines. What did you say that Joe, what Joe Swinson had done what with Parliament? Uh, uh, she hasn't declared it uh, among her interests when she declares her, you know, interests uh, to the oh, House right. of Commons. I didn't know that bit. I just was very concerned that, yes, my last MP was Duncan Hames. Duncan Hames. And, uh, yes. 
And, uh, you know, I've met him a few times. In fact, he actually got me mentioned in Parliament for the financial campaign I was involved in. And, of course, we all thought he was a really good egg. Just shows how wrong he can be. Well, that's right. I mean, now, look, he's not done anything wrong. He, he's, he's running this company and it gets funded from the European Union. But it sticks in the craw of many people who voted to leave that Joe Swinson says if the Lib Dems get a majority, it's unlikely. But, you know, stranger things happen at sea. <laughs> stranger things happen at sea. You know, if we got a majority, we would suspend or basically cancel Article 50 and try and stay in the European Union. And her husband is involved in a company that benefits financially from membership of the European Union. It is a cesspit. So these guys, so what do you see? Put on your, I don't know, look at your crystal ball metaphorically. What will happen in the next few days, do you think? And um, go ahead. Well, well, that, no, that's difficult. Insofar as I just, I don't focus on what's been happening in Parliament because the Lisbon Treaty, one of the pointers in the Lisbon Treaty, which I, I, I mentioned in a video from February and March, was the fact the demise of the House of Lords. And people just thought, this girl's just crazy. That's never going to happen. Now, look how we fast forwarded uh, seven, eight months. And now look what's happening. People think, oh, you know, the politicians have all joined in and said, oh, the House of Lords isn't fit for purpose. And, you know, I was looking at the front page of the Yorkshire Post. And uh, if we stay, staying in the European Union would mean that, that for a long time, they've known that we were going to be broken down into 12 regions. So we know um, from the videos I've done that the councils don't necessarily go to Parliament for many, you know, for many discussions. They actually follow the United Nations Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. So the conversation isn't really with Parliament anymore. It's already in place. We're just sort of play acting because, well, what do we do with the royal family? Because do we need a royal family anymore when obviously they've signed away our sovereignty in the first place? How do we retrieve our sovereignty? Because that's the key now. If, if, if our sovereignty was brought about by having a monarch, the queen is not our rightful monarch. And, you know, that in itself is such a mind blowing Fact minefield, it's a minefield. Truth. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot in that Absolutely. we could do. We could do a whole program on that. But I want to point out your 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 focus on the Lisbon Treaty and your video, which is an excellent um, summary of what the Lisbon Treaty is and what it means. Is it's a fact the European the, the Lisbon Treaty did several things, didn't it? One of the things it said explicitly was it wanted to reduce the power of individual European states to use its own veto power to say no to the European Union. It definitely but wants... that's changed, hasn't it? That qualified majority voting yeah, situation that's right. has changed. Yeah, that's right. As well as that, it, it's explicit in saying that while, you know, the UK has decided not to adopt the euro as currency, it is expected to adopt the euro in the very, very near future. That's a fact that's all in there. And when you say this, when you hear, because I listen to national radio, and you'll have young men and women, older men and women, they go on these national radio pro programmes and they say things like this, and the presenter just um, is rude to them or fobs them off. But these, th th these are absolute facts. The Lisbon Treaty, which most people have no idea what's in it, ratified by Ireland, even though we said no, sent back, ratified in this country without any mandate from the people whatsoever. To, to understand what's in it, even if you get beyond the legalese, as you said earlier on, the language you need a course in linguistics, I think you said, it is a terrifying thing what it means for the stock market in this country, what it means for our rights to say no to ever-increasing alignment militarily in the future. It's a dreadful thing. But people have no idea, Caroline. They haven't a clue. Having the thing is, the Lisbon Treaty, what they did was they made sure that Parliament would let the Lisbon Treaty go through, and they used a variety of ways. They basically had Tony Blair and uh, Jack Straw go over and sign um, some document in, in a monastery or a palace, and then, you know, Tony Blair gets told, oh, well, you've got to, um, you're going to have this, you've got to have the people's mandate for this, but then they engineer it. So then the next general election, 
uh, have a, the, oh, that's not bound. Those people that aren't bound by the referendum that was promised than the earlier refer, you know, the earlier promise. So that's what happens with the change in Parliament. So they've just engineered it. So then the Constitution Act came in, and basically we were able then to, by October 2009, to replace our British Constitution with an EU Constitution. So, you know, when people take people to court now, they're all working under, effectively, the EU Constitution. Yes. So we're never going to get justice whilst we have the banksters in charge. I mean, let's be honest, while everybody's looking at Brexit, what's the most important, what's the most expensive possession that you have, Richie? And don't tell me it's your wife. <laughs> the most expensive thing? Well, I've, I'm, I've, I'm mortgaged up to the wazoo, so I don't own that, so that's an expense every bloody month. But I suppose the next thing would be I've got a banger of an old estate car. If you're talking about material things. A car, that'd be Yeah, I'm really. talking about material things. Yeah, well, a, car. a lot of people, certainly um, the older generation, will have bought their house. Their Remember house, in, yeah. you know, when Margaret Thatcher came to power, it was a case of uh, people aspired to buy their own, didn't they? In, in whatever way. That's that right. Was the, that was the big purchase. Well, why is it that nobody talks about the fact that um, we don't own our houses, even when we've paid our mortgage off? Explain that, because our listeners' ears will be pricking up right now. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, because, because we actually don't. We get... So when you um, say you borrow the money from the bank and say you've paid it off, they give you the deeds if you want them, or you can have them kept in the bank or the solicitor's office, yeah? That's right. But you don't get the, you don't get the title. Because you don't... So you don't actually officially own... Your property, same with your car. If you look at your um, your documents pertaining to the car, your car registration, you are the registered holder. It doesn't say you actually physically own that car. So it's been very easy, it would appear, that for the secret courts to come along and take people's property away from them, especially in cases of dementia, and uh, they take hold of all and then, uh, you know, for you maybe to go into council accommodation, etc. You know, and we've also got not only that, I mean, for some people, their children are obviously going to be the most important if we're not talking about possessions here. Yeah, yeah. And how easy has it been now in recent years for in secret courts again Family for courts. people to have their children removed from them? On spurious grounds, yeah. I mean, we know that some children need to be taken out for very serious reasons but increasingly thousands of children are taken every year by family courts for something called risk of future emotional harm it's like something out of orwell you might cause some harm to your child in the near future so we'll take your child away you're absolutely right what would could could you come back when you're back down south and you're set up at home to talk about property ownership and car ownership yeah. and all of that. I'm not getting rid of you now or trying to get rid of you. I, w- I want to keep you for another few minutes. But uh, <laughs> but let's get into that in the near future. Caroline Stevens is our guest. And if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel before, y- you need only Google Caroline Stevens Seeking the Truth and you'll find the channel. And Karen's very interesting. Seeking the truth. Seeking, seeking the truth. Seeking the truth. I try to speak the truth, but I'm still seeking because nobody's, you know, it's the case of... How do you verify some documents sometimes, you know? Uh, It's very difficult, isn't it? Until you've been there and been behind the curtain, some people wouldn't believe what I've seen. Does that make sense? Well, listen, I'm your brother. Everything's not written (laughs) down, is it? It isn't, and I'm your brother on that front. You're absolutely right. Caroline, we're we're not going to leave. I I don't believe... I mean, I I got the referendum wrong. I predicted we would lose. And I thought we would lose because I thought it would be fixed in some way. And we didn't lose. And then I thought, well, they're Can never... I say something? Of course, Can jump right in, I jump do, in. I do believe the situation was fixed. When Why? I was the campaign manager for Leave EU, I took it upon myself to actually train the staff in, inside the office because, you know, some of these people had never... Uh, well, were very young and didn't know the rights and wrongs of the European Union. So I did training for the staff. And then, cause you see, I used to be a teacher. So I then trained the activists up and down the country. And you won't believe how, you know, when people come from a divide and conquer, you know, from different political parties, how difficult it is 
to actually bring people together. But that's what was my job, to bring people together. I would take people who'd worked and been affiliated with the Green Party, the Socialist Party, the Labour Party, and I'd take them to a UKIP event. And and it was it was a learning experience for everybody. And that's what, you know, now I can see uh, a big divide and I can see the, the trouble. I mean, you only have to look at what's happening in France, in Spain, and... Uh, Europe is is about to explode, is it not? It is. And do you think that those genuinely angry people who see what the European Union membership has done to their countries, do you think they are being presented with Trojan horses like Boris Johnson right across Europe? Do you think many of these leaders like Viktor Orban are again just establishment puppets made to look like genuine levers and they're not really. That's my suspicion. What do you think? Uh, Boris Johnson, two, what was it, a couple of weeks before he jumped ship from the Remain side and jumped to Leave, because I was actually working for Vote Leave at the point when, in fact, I was at Vote Leave on, I think it was the 1st or 2nd of March. He didn't actually choose to join the campaign until approximately the 8th of March wow. of the year of the referendum. And a couple of weeks before the vote, he fronted a video encouraging the membership of Turkey into the EU. He did, didn't Does that he? sound like somebody who really... Remember, he has got Turkish um, connections, he's got Jewish connections, he's a self-confessed Zionist. And I'm afraid that, you know, when people said to me in the past, this is a Zionist agenda... Well, I think people need to look at what Zionist Zionism was all about. Well, the Israeli state loves the European Union. I did a programme on that recently, talking about it. It is enamoured of the European Union, very close links there. So I can see um, why you would say that, absolutely. We're not going to go anywhere. Just before we run out of time today, and do come back uh, soon, when we'll have a bit more time and you're set up at your own um, broadcast station back home. What do you think is Brilliant. going? What do you think is going to happen when we don't leave property? Do you? And I don't want to see this. I'd like civil disobedience that is non-violent. I'd love that. I don't want to see violence. Do you think we're going to see violence here in this country? I hope we don't, but I do think we will. Um, when you said one of the reasons, one of the top reasons why people voted to leave was taking back control. And as I say, we've accepted all the EU legislation. We are still working under the EU constitution, which is Napoleonic codes. I mean, we've got David Noakes, who is under threat of the European arrest warrant to France. I'm sure I've done quite a few shows with him. And, uh, you know, what can you say? We've got, we signed, we're looking to sign a Kansas agreement with Canada, Australia and New Zealand to have free movement between all the countries. So not only are we going to have free movement coming up from Africa, but I'm not sure the New Zealanders and the Australians uh, are going to be too enamoured by having lots of people coming up into Europe from Africa and then uh, going over there as well. And you know, Caroline... the British public know anything about this. No, and the maddening thing about this is when somebody like you raises the point, they are immediately labelled as xenophobic or whatever. This is... I spoke to you today about my you know, political leanings back in the day. These days, they're all a bunch of crooks. But back in the day, my sympathies would have been with left-wing parties. No real left-winger or no trade unionist could ever support agreements like that because manufacturing jobs are scarce anyway. And you need manufacturing jobs for people whom are not stupid at all, but they are semi-skilled or they don't have third level education and if you're allowing an influx of other men and women into the country maybe some of them who are, whom are not skilled either you're killing the people in your own country that's what it's all about you're making their lives difficult and you're absolutely right to say that Karen I want to thank you for coming on today particularly because you're you're welcome you're, 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 you've got personal uh, stuff going on. I know you're caring for uh, someone there in Yorkshire at the moment so thanks for stepping out of that to, uh, to speak with us when you're back down south as it were uh, come back on when we'll speak about these issues in greater depth because there's been huge interest on Twitter. Lots of other issues we could have segued into and let me just say before we go again, Caroline Stevens seeking the truth. That's all you need to know. If you put that into the search on YouTube, you'll find Caroline's channel. It is really interesting. Lots of interesting 
monologues there and some very good interviews as well uh, with people. She mentioned David Noakes has been on this programme uh, and others as well. Thanks for your time, Caroline. Really enjoyed speaking with you and all the best to you there in Yorkshire. Thanks, Richie, and thanks to your uh, listeners back home. Really appreciate it. Bye for now. Caroline Stevens there, live on the line from Yorkshire. Very interesting lady. I came across one of Caroline's videos and uh, I said, I'm going to get her on. So I got her on. We'll get her back on in the very near future. What she was talking about there when it when she was pertaining to Lisbon, that's exactly what that treaty did. And people in this country knew nothing about it. In Ireland, we did. And because we did, we voted against it. The people rejected it. In this country, the people didn't know much about it. And they weren't given a chance anyway because it was ratified by the Blair government. Just signed off. There you are. No problem. Listen, this is the Richie Allen Show. So it is, be Jesus. For uh, the 15th of October 2019. Back with you in about 60 seconds. Stay with me, don't go anywhere. Francis Leader joins me in a few minutes. Renowned healer Mark Bayerski travels the world to find the most unique and powerful crystals for self-healing. Since the ancient times, crystals have been used as healing tools. They hold a natural healing vibration and are highly charged in positive energy. Mark teaches how to channel the universal energy and transfer it to the crystal to activate its healing power. Each crystal is used for its unique ability to target a different physical or emotional challenge. Mark Bayerski is an author, healer, speaker, and founder of the Pure Energy Healing Academy. He shares powerful messages of inspiration and healing on his daily YouTube videos, reaching millions worldwide. Mark's crystals, healing oils, and incense sticks are most sought after by other healers. His collection is available online at www.markbyersky.com. His work is presented through Lemon House, a company that creates and curates consciously made gifts. Right, welcome back to the programme. Just before we uh, call up uh, Francis there and get Francis back on the programme, let me remind you, it's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter and you can converse with one another on Twitter. It's very easy. Just uh, put Richie Allen Show, all one word. Put it into the search box. Richie Allen Show, press enter. And if you do that, you'll see what other people are tweeting me. It couldn't be simpler, I tell you. Couldn't be simpler. It's uh, five past the hour. It is uh, Tuesday, October 15th. Let's go to FSN. Ollie Barrett, I think, has got the headlines for us. Ah, you never know what might have happened in the last hour. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Oli Barrett. Mozambique is voting in a general election that some fear could test the country's fragile peace. The Trump administration is calling on Turkey to halt its invasion of northern Syria and has imposed sanctions on the country. Climate group Extinction Rebellion have been banned from protesting in London four days earlier than their demonstration was due to end. And EU chief negotiator Michel Barnier says if a Brexit deal is to be reached this week, the details need to be agreed by the end of Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, by the end of today. Thanks, Ollie. That's what they're saying anyway. But um, maybe it won't happen. Maybe it will. If it does happen, it'll go to the summit on Thursday, Friday to the remaining 26 countries or 27, is it? The remaining 27, that's right. And if they say yes, it'll go to Parliament on Saturday for a special sitting. This is the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, TriggerWarning.tv. Please have a listen to this. I'll be back with you in a minute. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to RichieAllen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. Ah, uh, you know, I love being with you. This is uh, Richie Allen with you until 7 o'clock. I'm in Salford in Greater Manchester. There's no better place to be. I love Salford. Yes! This is Deacon Blue on the most listened to independent radio show in Europe and Real Gone Kid back with Francis Leader in a couple of minutes time. And let's welcome back to the programme Francis Leader. Francis, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. What you the bloody well. hell? Do you know what it is? Um, honest to God, there isn't anything wrong financially here. It's all uh, topped up and in fact, landlines all over the world are covered in my subscription I pay about £50 or £60 a month and every landline in the Western world is is on that. I don't know why I couldn't ring you. I really apologise for that. You've wronged me. I've got to owe you some money now. 
But thanks for no. thanks for your patience. You're an amazing lady. I, I didn't even get a chance to introduce you properly. Um, many of our listeners know all about Frances Leader. Extraordinary woman. Got um, a brain the size of the UK. Has been uh, an activist for the environment for many years. The admin of Anti-Fracking International. Frontline activist um, since going way back to the Balcombe Protection Camp in 2013. There's so many more strings to your bow as well. Thanks for coming back on the programme and thanks for your patience today, uh, Francis. Listen, I wanted to jump straight into Quadrilla. And news, of course, that broke um, last week about um, Lancashire and Quadrilla's plans here. Um, Things looking bad for the company in the north of the country because of tremors, of course, and the implications of those tremors, but also because of the activism up here. It looked like it was curtains for Quadrilla and for fracking. But the company says that it isn't abandoning its fracking ambitions up here. Now, that's to, to, to one side. There's also, of course, your own activism and your own campaigning and the success you've had lately, very lately, which we're going to talk about. What is the state of fracking in the UK at the moment in terms of um, the health of uh, the big fracking companies and their plans here? Uh, what is the state of it at the moment in the UK? Well, I've had a um, look round at all the uh, active and proposed uh, sites and, um, in, you know, the, the pedal licences, and everything is just the same as it ever was. There's no let up on the possibility of fracking in the UK, despite the article that we saw in the uh, in the Guardian and in the Times at the beginning of this week. That was very misleading. It was, you know, the, the activists in Lancashire were all cock a hoop that the um, stripping of fracking equipment from the Preston New Road site was to them signifying the end of um, the, the situation. They even put up a, a poster on the on the uh, on the gate there saying that everything was for sale. You know, as if as if they'd gone bust or something. It just is not that is not the case. Whenever, whenever a, a drilling company moves from one stage of a, a, an exploration for oil or gas to another stage, they always take out the previous equipment because it just gets in the way. They're moving on to a flow test. They've already flow tested successfully at Preston New Road and they're going to carry on. But not only at Preston New Road, let's not only focus on that because there are other sites in the country that are still operational, such as in um, Surrey and in um, Misson. So I, uh, although I would love to be able to say, yeah, we're coming to the end of our campaign, I don't see it happening. There's only, if you look at what... Um, Boris Johnson is saying today, in fact, he's um, proposing an environmental bill which will protect and improve the environment for future generations, he claims, right? And every, every target within that bill would be met by stopping oil and gas exploration in the UK. He wants to improve the quality of our water, and, of, uh, and fracking is a serious threat to that. He wants to um, preserve the environment for future generations. Well, <laughs> he also wants to cut plastic, w- cut plastic waste. Well, you can't, plastic is made from fracked gas. He wants to cut air pollution. Well, air pollution is partially methane, which is fracked gas. I just... I, I wrote to him today and said, you can achieve all of this by banning fracking. By banning it. Now, has fracking taken place in this country or has exploratory work taken place? Because when listeners go looking for information on it, they often get mixed messages all over the place. I had somebody came on to me today said, brilliant, you've got Francis Leader back on the programme. We've forgotten about fracking. And of course, I haven't as a, as a broadcaster. It's been your life for years. Uh, Francis, um, it's hugely important, obviously. So has it gone on the 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 withdrawal of gas 
shale, um, boy fracking equipment, or has it been exploratory work in the last few years? What's happened? It's, it's just exploratory at this stage. Um, they haven't actually uh, taken any fracked gas out of any well and put it into the um, national grid. They haven't done. This no. is really important. And it's also important... It's, well, it's positive. Positive. It's positive. You, know, you can't say yeah. very many things about yeah. uh, the oil and gas industry in this country that are positive. Um, but, you know, to, from, to, from my point of view, when, uh, um, when I look at the situation we have with fracking, I don't, you know, I, I'm not vain enough to assume that our um, campaigning has been in any way a break on the oil and gas industry, not anywhere near so much as the geological structure of Britain. We've got the most convoluted geological structure. It's really difficult to to isolate and find the Boland Shale, which is the where the gas is supposed to be trapped around Lancashire and across the country to Yorkshire. They it's fractured into like if you imagine if you imagine you've got a cake and you've cut it into lots of pieces and put some up and some down that's what it's like so they've got to drill and get a little bit and then move along a bit drill get a little bit and move along a bit the the expense of this makes it just so illogical so i'm i have more faith in british geology than in the, in, in the government's ear to what we are saying. Yeah, the government said all along, great for jobs, which is a nonsense, um, energy and what that will do for the economy, that's a nonsense as well. And mm-hmm. people like you have been exposing that what it does do is it renders the area around the fracking, maybe for, for many miles, uninhabitable, It'll destroy the, 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 the soil. It'll, it'll seep into water supplies, which is devastating for people and for animals. But I've got to point out, uh, when Francis was first on this program, uh, if I remember rightly, it was to talk about something hugely important. And I kind of put you in a kind of a whistleblower category because mm. you believe that there are many aspects to this whole fracking agenda. And one of them is to bury the UK's nuclear waste. Do you want to talk about that? Well, yes, that, that is what we were talking about before. And thank you so much for um, taking me seriously when I, when I talked about that because it was so hard to get that information out to people. And I was uh, subsequently able to create a, um, a whole um, article that backed up everything I said in, in that conversation. It was brilliant what you did. It, it was brilliant because I, I had people saying, you've got some crazy kooks on, Richie. You've got one on now. And I said, no, this woman is not crazy. Um, is not a kook. Um, she's, she's very, very, very smart. And she has the information at hand to support the argument she's making, which you published online to your eternal credit. And this is massively important that our listeners understand this. Because I've often said, you know, wherever somebody in official, in an official capacity digs a great big hole, there's always somebody else who thinks, well, what can we put into that hole? What can we do with it now that, you know, well, we've, we've dug it, we've put pipes in there, we've put billions of gallons of water in there, we've extracted some shale, we might get some gas out of there. Now we've got a great big hole. And you were able to demonstrate to me, um, at the very least, now you did more than that, but at the very least that there are plans to fill those cavities with the UK's nuclear waste, which is absolutely insane, isn't it? Remind our listeners. Yeah, yeah it is. It, the, uh, I think the major thing that most people don't seem to realise is when you drill down as far as they drill down, every piece of muck and fluid that comes back up out of that well is radioactive, whether you're fracking or just exploring for oil and gas conventionally. Whatever you're drilling a well for, it doesn't matter. If it's going down that far, it's coming up with radioactive material. And that comes up onto the uh, drill deck, 
and that affects the staff and that and <laughs> and and the immediate environment and people living nearby. Do you want to explain that, Francis, in as simplistic terms as you can? How does the actual fracking create radioactive um, waste? How does it do that? It's drilling through strata that is radioactive. Right. It's got uh, radon, particularly. It's got radon in it. Yeah. And so it, when, when the drill... Uh, ex- as the drill goes down, it, it, just like if you're drilling into a piece of wood, you're going to get a lot of waste coming from your, from, your, from your little hole, aren't you? Loads of bits and pieces lying around. That's right. Right, but well, it's exactly the same with an oil rig. And out in the North Sea, what they do is jettison all that over, overboard into the sea. So they've got no way of cleaning radioactivity out of materials or water. So what are they going to do with it? If they're doing it on land, they can't jettison it overboard like they do from the oil rigs in the North Sea. They've got to put it somewhere. And what they're doing in America is re-injecting it into used wells. In fact, fracking was invented for that purpose in the first place. In 1963, it was in the newspapers in America, and I've, on my um, article that I wrote, I've actually got the newspaper clippings to prove that. So this was, that, this was, this was taking nuclear waste from nuclear power stations and putting it in fracked sites. That was the plan. That was, that was the plan, yeah. And you that is you what proved is going this. On in a, you proved this. Yeah. Is, this, is what, so this is huge. And it was huge when you first talked. It's huge now. This is massive. You have, And your husband played a big part in this, didn't he? In you understanding it. Do I remember that right? Yes, yeah. Unfortunately, he, um, he fought cancer for the last 20 odd years of his life. And uh, so did a great many of the people that he worked with. And they still do. Uh, I, I have people getting in touch with me quite regularly saying another one's got cancer, another one's got cancer. And you're, you're like, it, it, uh, it, is, it is horrible to have to, to know that that is what caused it in the first place. Um, my husband worked as um, an ordinary uh, oil rig worker, you know, to begin with. First of all, he was actually on the drill. And on a daily basis, he was getting soaked with the drilling muds and um, the muck that was coming back up out of the well. And then, of course, uh, finally, when they did hit oil, he got soaked in that as well. And then, because he thought, cause you see, we were so young and, and he was so... We were, we, he, we were never told there was any radioactivity concerned. He came home from a shift once with an oil drill bit which is made of tungsten, extremely heavy, and he popped it in front of me and said, look, that was the bit that discovered the oil in the Magnus field. And I said, that's wonderful, darling. I couldn't blooming lift this thing. It was, it was only about six inches across with all sticky out bits, ugly as anything. And uh, he thought this was, you know, the sun shone out at the bottom of this thing. And, I, <laughs> and, I, and it's only now that I realise yeah, literally, the sun did shine out of the bottom of this thing. It was as radioactive as it could be. And it sat in my lounge for years. I used it as a doorstop. Can you believe it? How naive was I? This is a massive... <laughs> this is a massive... It, it's not a secret, but it is a secret because drilling does release radio nuclei radio nuclides i think you say i i know this from only from you from researching um when when you first spoke on the program but it isn't something that people understand or even know about and often the people who work offshore they're not made aware of it and i believe that the environmental protection agencies they play down the amount of radioactive waste material that is generated no, no, through drilling. No, Richie, no. They ignore no, it, do they? they? Don't, they don't play down. They, it, they do not mention it. They don't, ag- yeah, they don't agree with it. They Be- don't mention it. And neither do the companies that employ their staff. I mean, I, um, uh, my husband was the kind of guy that was a hands-on, huge, great 
a Scottish lump of muscle. He wasn't in the remotest part interested in anything to do with paperwork. That was my job in his life, to deal with all his paperwork. He didn't want to know at all. And I read every single word that BP sent to us. And believe me, they sent us so much bump. You know, it's the, the BP magazine and this change and that change and this piece of news and that piece of news about their operations all over the world. And I read all this stuff, not just because I'm, uh, I, I was interested to, to see what was going on. I wasn't in particularly interested in BP, but, but to make sure that there was nothing that my husband didn't understand. So uh, if I had seen anything related to radioactivity, I would have jumped pulled him, pulled him out, out of my it. skin. I yeah. never saw any mention of it at all. And that's what upsets me now, that, you know, that he suffered as much as he did because we didn't know and were never told. And do you believe, Francis? Francis Leader is our guest, by the way, the environmental campaigner and journalist. You can find Francis on Facebook and on Twitter as well. Let me give you Francis's Twitter um, account before we move on. Um, if you look for Fran Francis Leader activist on Twitter, you'll get her. Um, but I'll tweet out a link to uh, her Twitter page anyway. It's at 2013 Boudica, and that's B-O-O-D-I-C-C-A, at 2013 uh, Boudica, Francis Leader activist. Do you, I know we touched this ground before, so don't think now that I ignored you the first time when you told me this. I, I remember every bit of it, but again, because this is so important and because we're going back to about it, because you've been, you were on with me a, three or four months ago, but we're going back now to last year when we spoke. So I want to yeah. go over this ground again. Do you, be right. do you believe that the big drilling organisations, do you believe that they knew or, or even know about this exposure for their employees and they've covered yes. it up? Absolutely, without a doubt. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that they know, none, there, none whatsoever. Is there any smoking gun at all, any bit of paperwork that shows that they know that they're exposing their employees to radioactive materials and that could cause them health complications. Is there anything at all that's in any of their paperwork? No, no nothing there isn't. whatsoever, no. Well, um, I've got a friend actually that has tried to um, go through a compensation using lawyers, etc., trying to get compensation for uh, uh, an extreme exposure that he suffered when he was working uh, for Shell. And uh, he has hit a brick wall for years and years to the point where it's exhausted him. And of course, he's, he's ill with cancer. So uh, it's actually probably the anxiety attached to trying to get this acknowledged has probably uh, exacerbated his illness. So he, he's giving up, which is tragic. And why didn't we get an Aaron Brockovich type journalist, you know, talking about this in the 70s and 80s and 90s because you said and I know I know you're right because you've you've proved it you've provided the evidence it wasn't just your husband rest in peace but lots and lots and lots of people exposed right at not so much the coal face but out there in the North Sea and everywhere else exposed to it so many of them have developed illnesses where are the bloody journalists writing stories about this has anybody ever taken this yeah. on no, no one, no. Which, to me, uh, is uh, uh, is indicative of the truth of it. Because, let's face it, what do we see in our mainstream media? What do we see? We see absolute rubbish. We, uh, oh, oh, I must tell you, three weeks, or when was it? A couple of weeks back, I had three weeks of uh, no internet. Right, which was a real blow to me. I didn't know what to do with myself. And uh, during that three weeks, out of desperation, I was listening to um, BBC Radio 4, which I... <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Well, no, no. I was, I, I, I was lasting, must have been about five or ten minutes at a time before I was battering the, the, <laughs> the radio yeah, to yeah, turn yeah. it off. And all they were focusing on in the news were two issues. Brexit, negatively. Oh, we don't want it. Oh, it's terrible. 
and um, the the uh, riots going on in Hong Kong. And I was jumping up and down here, saying, well, but yeah, but what about the Gilets Jaunes in France, right yeah. next door, that's been going on for nearly a year? What on earth? And oh, honestly, I get so frustrated with the mainstream media, I, I try to avoid it as much as I possibly can. But during that time when I had no internet, I, you know, I must admit, I allowed myself to be infiltrated by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, gets, it, gets, it gets into your brain, doesn't it? I, I, oh, it I'm was exposed terrible. to a lot of it. It is dreadful, and it's, yeah, it is what it is. And increasingly, it seems to be working on people because I don't think we are going to leave the European Union. I know you understand what the European Union is and you came to your conclusion yourself that the UK would be better off out of it but the truth is I suppose you well I, I should ask you I shouldn't assume would would it be fair to say that if the UK did leave the European Union we wouldn't exactly be in great hands if we were if our futures were being determined by the likes of Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg for example what do you think uh, you know what I mean by that? Is, I mean, uh, if, yeah, if, I if we properly saying, left... But I'm trying to think how to say this yeah. without sounding like a complete kook, but I don't, I don't believe in politicians. They are puppets on a stage. Yeah, yeah. The people that make the actual decisions are, we are unnamed in entities that we know nothing about and we never see. And the objective globally is totalitarianism. Now, by trying to devolve from the EU, the British people have made a stance against totalitarianism, and that's why they are doing everything they can to prevent us from leaving the Union. Yeah, so forget about Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg. It's stupid of me to be concerned about that. The fact is, people understand that membership of the European Union is something much, much more sinister. They, I think they have an innate feeling about this, even if they can't articulate it. And I don't mean they're stupid. They're not stupid. But most people, I think, understand that the European Union is, is not a good thing for them and their prospects. And you summed it up. It's ultimately about concentrating the power into kind of less and less and less hands. So eventually you've got... Well, the, this is it, right? The power has... I think the power has been in very few hands for a very long time and our um, and we have been controlled by il by this illusion that we have a franchise we have a vote we have a we have um, a nation but but the people that actually control this world don't think about it in terms of nations they think about it in terms of it's a binary thing for them. It's the core and the gap. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you before, but you know, Caroline, I was listening to Caroline earlier, isn't she great? Very good, yeah. And, yeah, and she, she referenced the um, Marrakesh UN Migration Compact from December 2018, where we've signed up to accept waves of immigration and that's via the UN that's got nothing to do with the EU so our problem is not with the servants to me the EU is the servant of the UN which is the servant of the black nobility which is um, ancient families that have owned and run or or consider themselves to have the right to rule. Are we talking and, about and the bloodlines, Francis? We're talking about the bloodlines now, right? Yeah, the black nobility is uh, a nickname, their, their own nickname for their bloodlines. There's, there's quite a few of them. But they, um, they control um, operations such as the um, Committee of 300. They have their little representatives in there. But the compact that Caroline was referencing presages the imposition of a borderless world, which 
in which migration is considered a human right. How clever of them to do that, yeah, right? Yeah. And there are also clauses in that compact which create a new crime, the crime of objecting to migration. That development, that development makes a total mockery of any idea of secession from any of their globalist structures, including the EU. So what we're seeing is a clear indication that the United Nations is the major driving force behind globalism and who's behind the, the United Nations, who set it up in the first place. <clears throat> I've been writing about this for ages. Um, the United Nations accepted worldview has dispensed with the idea of nations entirely. It now views the world, uh, like I said, in a binary fashion. There are only two regions. Forget the countries. We're in the core. And this whole big section in the middle is called the gap. If you live in the gap, which includes most of uh, uh, South America, um, the Caribbean, all of Africa, all of the Middle East, and the islands going out to Australia, but not Australia. So if you live in the gap, you have two choices. You die or you migrate. And I know that sounds harsh, but that is the game here. If you live in the core, like we do, and Americans, and even the Russians, most of Europe, China, all included in the core, you have no choices. You have to accept migrants, poverty, compacted living, and above all, debt. Debt is modern slavery. Therefore, humanity is being rearranged deliberately. Whole communities displaced, destroyed, bombed out. The countries that are wealthy now will be impoverished as they stretch their services to absorb massive immigration from the countries in the gap. That's why it's important that there's a new crime to hate, to not accept. If it is yeah, a crime yeah, yeah. to not accept migration. Can I, can I just endorse you? Again, because some people listening to this program will be expecting me to jump in on you. Because I do jump in <laughs> oh, I do jump in on other guests. Oh, you're giving her an easy ride, Richie. Well, the, the, the UN Global Migration Pact of uh, December uh, last year in Marrakesh, everything Francis said about it there is true. It's exactly what's planned to happen. And they have created um, the framework or the basis for, you know, for statutes to be created where, where it will be criminal to talk about migration in a derogatory way or to complain about it. Um, and you have to ask why, and you talked about the United Nations and its importance over the European Union here, and you're right to do that. And you didn't mention the Rockefellers' names, you didn't have to. Um, not for me anyway, but many of our listeners maybe. I don't know if they understand this. this do you, does that sometimes blow your mind, Francis, that this has been planned forever? I mean, when, when I used to sit around a dinner table with David Icke back in London in 2013, mm. when David Icke lived with uh, Caroline and myself, we would have a glass of wine and wine down, glass of cheap vino from the uh, 7-Eleven shop next door, uh, Vardy's or something like that, or Hardy's wine or something. And we'd be having a little glass of wine. And David Icke would say what, what, what even he found sometimes, he'd be shaking his head, is the planning for this. It's been around forever. And for me, that's what proves the bloodline thing, that this has been a generational thing going back maybe even several hundred years. Does that blow oh, your I mind? Suppose, I reckon it's thousands. I reckon it's thousands, thousands. of years old. Why, can I ask you this? Why would somebody play a long game like that? Like if you're one of these bloodlines and you're back in the 14th century, but you said thousands of years, so let's say you're back in the, you're back in BC times. Why would you be interested in a generation, excuse me, in a plan that wouldn't come to fruition for several thousand years. I don't want to put you on the spot now because I, I kind of agree with what you're saying, but I wonder why would they play such a long game? Control. The clearing of the gap of, of 
uh, human beings, literally depopulation of a huge area of the earth. It's not for their the stated reason that they give in the uh, agendas 21 and 2030. They say they want to rewild huge parts of the world. That's bullshit. They're actually intending to control resource. Uh, look, if you imagine this, right, in the future, this is what they hope to achieve. They're going to uh, imprison humanity in cities. And the only links between those cities will be like train lines, possibly underground, so that no one actually gets to see the rewilded places. And I honestly, seriously suspect that they have no intention of rewilding anything. They're just going to turn it all into a massive, great big mining operation for their... For, I, I just get a really apocalyptic view, vision coming into my head when I think of it. Because it seems to me that they're forcing humanity to be compacted into the, into the core. And that will be catastrophic for ethnicities, cultures, national identities. Well, they'll all disappear. And the consequences are already beginning to show because we can see the migrants on the move in large numbers. Yeah escaping the deliberate physical and economic destruction of their homelands. They're not welcome in the core. And so, of course, tensions are going to arise between them and the resident populations. Uh, and Is that the biggest tragedy, be. Francis? Is that the biggest tragedy that culture, national identity is, is, is scrubbed out and what we do is we kill one another? all of the different national identities and the different cultures, all yeah, yeah. lovely. Because we will be, there will be yeah. intense competition for, yeah. the, for the basic essentials of life, like food, homes and jobs, which we're already seeing. It, that intense competition will increase and increase and increase until people are actually tearing each other apart. Uh, so the idea of, of cramming us all into cities, which they seem to think, oh, smart cities as well, which will be uh, thoroughly surveyed and, and uh, you know, this system they've got in, in China that they, they hope oh, to Oh, Jesus, spread. yeah. The smart yeah. social crediting <laughs> I mean, system is mad, yeah, crazy. And it's coming here. Absolutely. You say, you say one thing in objection to their system and you lose social credit to the point where you won't be allowed to travel. You will be, ob you will be hated by your friends and neighbours because if you get a black dot against your character, it affects your family and any contacts you may have. So, of course, people will just estrange you oh, at a later not. Oh, do, it's it, a horrific it, view. It kills me, and Francis. Can I, can I, can I, can, do you know why it kills me? Because you've, you've summed up there, we will... We will hate one another and blame one another for the circumstances that you just described as we're competing for ever-decreasing resources, food, yeah. water. We kill one another and we fall into identity politics. And this okay. kills me. And we never think of, well, hang on a second, we're all the same. Okay, we're experiencing the world differently. You're experiencing, experiencing it as a black man. I'm experiencing it as a white man. But ultimately, we are the same. We have a common enemy, and yet we don't unite to take on that enemy. We end up squabbling over the things we squabble about. And, of course, the media feeds into that. And we have race baiting everywhere, even in the independent media. And we all fall for it. All of us. Well, maybe not all of us, but most of us. And the, the antagonist well, laughs all the way to the bank, right? Yep. Yeah. In the long term, this is global communism for the few survivors of all this upheaval. And they will be controlled by an inescapable, undemocratic, totalitarian elite. It's, it, to me, this is obviously what is going to happen. Is there any way that we... Can I first ask you, because a number of listeners have said they believe the bloodlines are pre-Sumerian. And... Yeah, yeah that's, that, that can be traced that way, yeah. I agree with them. Is it a non-human thing? Do you remember Jim Mars, God rest his soul, one of the greatest men that ever lived, Jim Mars? Yes. And yes. G Jim believed, and I know he did, and I know Jordan believes, and others, and David and others, that at some stage, 
there is some non-human hybrid, there is some non-human contact with these families. Something otherworldly. I know when we talk about this, you and I, because you're a very, very smart woman. You know I wouldn't say that to butter you up. You are incredibly bright. I like to I think... I wish you'd stop saying things like no, that. No, but you that, are. Richie. It People... makes me go red. I get really embarrassed. Not at all. Honest, I do. No, no, you are. You're incredibly <laughs> bright. And I like to think I'm kind of bright. I'm not as bright as you, but I'm kind of bright. So when people like us who are reasonably bright and articulate, when mm. we speak about otherworldly aspects to this, a lot of people go, they are crazy bastards. There they were. It was interesting for a while. And now they've gone into this kind of esoteric. I used to laugh at David. I, when I used to first interview Ike years ago, I used to laugh in his face about this stuff. Well, I was polite. I was polite. So did I. So did I. You're not on your own. I used to go out of it. I, and you know, because I, because I was decent, he would put up with my giggling and we would talk about things that we had common ground on so I wouldn't insult him or be rude to him because I respected his intelligence but I used to say to him You're, this is mad stuff let's move on to something else now I think he was kind he must have been right is there something other worldly to this madness do you think no I don't you don't agree I, with it you, you don't think it does listen don't feel free to shoot me down this is an open forum you don't think there is an alternate reality version of this or a non-human entity to this, you don't believe so? No, I don't. I think this is um, certain human beings that many, many thousands of years ago uh, took upon themselves a sense of royalty, that they had the right to rule everyone else, assumed that they were more intelligent than everyone else. And started practicing all sorts of esoteric uh, uh, religions and stuff which they did not pass on to the people and thereby you wound up with a very, very few that were like an elite who thought that they were manipulating the spiritual entities of the world and all this and the, and the majority of people who were just getting on down and living in their physical little selves happily, well, not happily, but, you know, right, doing right. the best they could in reality. So I don't think it's um, an external force. I think it is a matter of um, spiritual belief because a lot of these people believe in, you could, they're definitely atheists. They might even be nihilists because they, they seem to, believe in a spiritual um, superiority that they have. Is it satanic in any way? Do they, are they satanists, some of these people? Well, people do say that, don't they, that they're satanists. But I have a problem with that because I don't believe in Satan. That's a load of old talk. Neither do I, but I, it, doesn't mean that they don't, <laughs> it doesn't mean that they don't. Though we've seen the, no, Rot, we've right, seen the Rothschild I, I parties with, with the bloody crazy um, uh, Baphomet... Um, helmets and goats and all that these people are sick some of them and, and you wonder maybe they believe in it even if it isn't true I'm, I'm sure they do I'm yeah. sure they're poor I feel sorry you know it's, I know this is daft right but I feel sorry for these people I really do I mean they've they've got this spiritual superiority the minute you think that you're superior to any other living being you fell off the track. You're a twat. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, nobody's superior to anybody else. I don't care what your job is. I don't care what title you think you've got. I don't care whether you... I mean, I, I even consider this blooming fly that's flying my, around my room annoying me today. <laughs> I, even, I even consider him to be, you know, yeah. an essential soul in this universe. All of us are equally essential we are e- immortal, spiritual beings. So do you dismiss out of hand, and I don't think you do, I think you're very open-minded, um, mm. m- more than I am. I- I'm getting more open-minded as I go along. But do you dismiss then what I believe? And I don't believe this because David Icke talked about it. I do not. I argued about this for years. I came to my own understanding of it. But that maybe we are the spiritual beings of energy, and that what, what we perceive to be real is not, that it might be holographic, that it might exist only because 
we believe it does or we download it. And if that's the case, maybe something created this kind of prison for our consciousness and that maybe these bloodlines you talked about earlier on, maybe they're in on the gag maybe. Or do you just do you think that's a bit silly as well? Because that's kind of where I am. If I had to put okay. money on something. Hmm. I'm an idiot, do you think? I think, I think yes, sir. <laughs> I think, you know, look, I, I, I put my little self, you know, my, I'm just a nobody, right? And I put myself in that position. Would I want to exploit the whole world and rule the whole world and own everything and every part of the whole world? No, I bloody well wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, I like to see people with entrepreneur real entrepreneurial ideas that have never entered my head i i love the intelligence of of a two-year-old if we if we if if they think that they are superior to us they're not right in the head yeah. <laughs> that's all i can say i feel sorry for them because they're mentally ill and what's worse about them is if you think about it Generation upon generation, they've taught their kids, who have taught their kids, who've taught their kids, that they are superior to the rest of the world. That's, that's, cra- that's passing on psychosis, isn't it? They're exalted and they are illuminated. We are talking about the Illuminati, right? We use so many different words to describe these uh, these people. W- would that be a fair word to use, Illuminati? No. No? No, they're just... No. <laughs> I don't like to use any word about them except for psychotics and yeah. and predators. I wouldn't use a positive word. Illuminati means enlightened. Yeah, enlightened, yeah, yeah. They're not enlightened. Christ, if they were enlightened, they would realise that they're no more important than this blooming fly that's annoying me. <laughs> <laughs> How have they gotten away? Before we... Because we have gone over time. I've gone over time because it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, speaking oh, with yeah, you, uh, we, have, yeah. we have, but to be fair, I couldn't reach you early on and I didn't want to be cutting you short either because um, it's, it is genuinely a thrill to have you on. I do mean that, Francis. I know I've got the old brogue, the old charm. I know I do, but uh, ultimately, <laughs> no, I do mean it. I love having you on. I love listening to you. Um, I love listening to you too, Richard. You're a, this is a mutual, the mutual appreci- I love society. it, the Mutual Appreciation Society. Well, why, <laughs> yeah. why have they gotten away with it then? Over the I centuries? Think, I think to begin with, really early on, they got away with it because they were the only people who could read and write. And then when it came to establishing the uh, Catholic Church, um, which was literally the Roman Empire, who was too lazy to have soldiers, and that was too expensive, so they made the Catholic Church, which controls people's minds and can be done for years. That went on for years and years and years because people couldn't read Latin, and they had to rely on their local priest to direct them, their souls. And they were told a load of rubbish about this and that, and you're going to go to hell if you yeah. pick your nose on Friday or whatever. I mean, it's only really been very, very recently that the, that the majority of us can read and write and choose what we read and write. We don't have to believe any particular religion. Well, we don't, you and me. We don't have to believe any particular religion. It's not forced on us like it used to be in the past. I mean, take Spain, for instance. You know, because you lived there, up until 1975 when Franco died, everybody in Spain had to be Catholic. It wasn't, you know, there was no, I mean, that's fascism. It's Catholicism. And that has gone on and on and on. And it's when, when the Reformation occurred and people said, no, no, hang on a minute. We don't want to see our um, religious texts in Latin because we can't read that. We'd like to see it in our own languages. That's when the lid came off. That's when people said, no, hang on a minute. It doesn't say anything in this Bible here about going to hell and burning for a yeah, million years. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. Or, no. And so, and so the freedom began then, really. So we should be great. I am eternally grateful to learning to read and write. Well, hang on a second. I, hang on a second. There's, there's, there's a possible contradiction there. Well, not a contradiction, but... No, no, <laughs> not a contradiction, but an area worth exploring. Um, we might finish on this, because this is good. I would have described myself, as you did a few minutes ago, as an atheist, traditionally. 
But but yeah. maybe if we are beings of light and energy, maybe there yeah. is a source. Maybe there is an intelligent source that we possibly couldn't understand, the Godhead or the God or something. And maybe these families, yeah, these yes, bloodlines... Yeah, there is, and it's us. It's all of us together joined up. We are that Godhead, all split up into lots of little bits. Yeah, that's but, what I think. And you might be right. I mean, what do I know? But but what about? <laughs> but but you know, but those who think that we did come from something supreme, maybe, and that maybe these bloodlines and these, um, you know, educated or at least they thought they were educated. These families going back, maybe they um, worked to or worked towards disconnecting us from um, the the God figure or the supreme being or or whatever. Maybe there's a good argument to be made for that too. You know, if if they were intent on manipulating us, you know, the the rest of us, into doing what they wanted us to do and seeing things as they wanted us to see them, maybe they yeah. maybe they've told us lies about where we come from. Maybe there is some supreme being. That's all I'm saying. I'm not you know, I'm not just mm. playing semantics here with you. Well, um I, I particularly love writers like Lao Tzu. He wrote the Tao Te Ching, he's a Taoist. And there's no mention of one being. It's all about qi. And when you study qi from a Chinese medical point of view, I, I did Chinese medicine for a number of years. When, when you look at it from that point of view, everything is qi. We are like it, and you can't really describe it as electromagnetic energy, but you wouldn't be holding yourself together without this electric energy that is going through you and there is electric energy in the universe even NASA admits that so maybe the God soul thing that we've all got a bit of is an electric magnetic energy and it's on a mission but each little bit doesn't really know what the mission is but doesn't need to know because the whole knows and that's, like, yeah, maybe yeah. we're feed, maybe we're all like little computer end, computers, all feeding back to a mainframe, and that mainframe is our collective knowledge, and it's not just us, of course. It, there must be billions of other stars and uh, which have planets like ours. I'm pretty certain there are other life forms in the universe, and they're all part of it as well. But, you know, you listen to us. What are we all about? No, it's very you, important. I, I, we don't do enough of it on the programme. It's too, it's too news-centric lately. And oh, th yeah. that's, that's a problem. Life is yeah. at the moment. And, and that, that tells you it's all a massive distraction. Of course it is. To stop you from loving your, yourself, your universe, and life and everything. It, all these things are distracting you and filling you with fear when you should actually be full of joy every time you get out of bed in the morning. Oh, wow, I'm going to learn something new today. And meet somebody because everything new. you learn is, down, is downloaded back to that mainframe that feeds the whole thing. And I firmly believe in reincarnation. I absolutely, you know, because I'm getting towards the end of my life now. And I'm absolutely looking forward to it. I mean, where am I? <laughs> where am I going next? Oh gosh, it's, you know, it's so exciting. Well, I hope you'll be around for quite a bit more time than you think you'll be around for. But yeah, it's an interesting thing that I've often contemplated that as well. If we do go around again, you know, what will it be like? And I've gotten into that with people on the program in the past. Um, I think we'll leave it there for for today, if that's okay with you. And uh, look, thanks for coming back on. Very important stuff talking about the uh, the fracking, the nuclear waste, the radioactivity on and in and around oil fields and drilling, which people don't know about. Massive, massively important stuff. Uh, I don't, I'm not paying lip service to that. This is hugely important. And of course, the nature of reality, where we came from, who the controlling bloodlines are and how they've managed to do it. These are all really important areas of research, which I do concede haven't, you know, been getting into enough on the programme because of the madness of Brexit and all of that. But look, we'll try and redress that in the uh, in the coming weeks and months for sure. There's no two ways about that. Francis, do you want to remind our listeners where they can uh, find more about you, the ones who maybe haven't heard you before? Um, 
apart from on, I, I'm, I'm, I, I've given up with, with Facebook completely. I'm, I, and I, I'm on Twitter as much as I can be. And I love Twitter. It's fun. Um, 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 but I also do a blog on Steam It. I, ha- I, must, I must confess, right, I didn't tell you, but I had a stroke. And since that stroke, I haven't written any articles at all. And when I go back to look at what I have written, I've written over 860 articles on Steemit. And when I read what I've written before, I haven't got anything to add. It's like, I've, oh, it's all there. I've done it. You know, I, I might re, retweak it or rearrange it, but it's all there in, in my Steemit blog, which, you know, is ludicrously long because I'm such a blabbermouth. Yeah, it's so all the detail. Okay, we, we, you send me a private message with the link to the Steam. It. I've seen the articles, but send me a, a, a link um, to the to the general page, and I, and I'll tweet it out for people, and I'll put it on uh, the YouTube notes as well. Um, I'll have to do that tomorrow. I'll put the YouTube video up later, but I'll amend it tomorrow. I didn't. Um, I'm sorry to hear you had it's a stroke. It's dead easy. Is it's it? dead easy. You just get to Steam it, and it's Francis Leader. I never change my name so that I don't. So Don't confuse people. Hey, tell me about the stroke. Hey, eh? was how are you? Oh, well, I'm terrific. You were honestly I, the only reason I knew I'd had a stroke was I woke up in the morning. When was this? It was when was it? Was it March? It was March. I had this stroke, right? And I, I woke up in the morning and I had numb patches in my hands and in my left leg. I thought, well, it's blooming funny. I must have laid on that funny or something. You know, I got yeah. up and. I, I couldn't make my left leg do what I was thinking it was doing. You know, I, I went to walk out of my, my bedroom and it just wasn't wasn't cooperating. And I thought, well, that's, that's peculiar. So I just ignored it, carried on with my day. And it didn't, it, it didn't ease off. It, it, it stayed the same. And a couple of days later, I said to my son, something funny's gone on here because this hasn't righted itself. And uh, he persuaded me we should contact the doctor. And the doctor persuaded me that I should go into hospital. And I, I, I'm the world's worst when it comes to going into hospital or taking any pharmaceuticals or anything. You know, I'm like, oh, no, you ain't getting me in there. And um, I said, oh, all right. And I went along and they kept me in and they did a brain scan on me and they found two small bleeds on the right hand side of my brain at the bottom of the back behind my ear and uh, then they asked me how did I think this had happened because I was asleep this happened while I was asleep and I thought this is weird why did I how did I blow a fuse literally in my sleep and I can only assume that I had got myself too emotionally worked up about stuff, you know, all of the subjects we talk about, all of the all of the distractions and the politics and the, and the hatred and the, and the wars and all of that. I do. Do I you do believe get really that? Upset. Do you believe mm. that that if you don't like use some sort of a pressure valve to release all the tension that we all kind of have when we consider these subjects? Do you believe that? That's what might have led to your little bleeds. Thank God they were little, by the way. But because we get that worked up about it, that we don't disconnect from it often enough. Yeah, I think I think that's what I did personally. That's what I did, I, and so that that pulled me up by my shorts and curlies. And I thought, right, that's it. I'm not going to let myself get in a state about all these twats anymore. I'm going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to try not to, to do a bit of om in, yeah. and and you know, and and try to chill out and and see that um, it's not my personal responsibility to ensure that the world try is a nicer place. It's not my job. It, I, I'm just one small little speck and I've got to stop trying to reach beyond my capabilities. And uh, 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 the main thing, the main I have to tell you, the main thing that uh, stopped me dead and made me start being more, more cool in my emotions was my son. You see, I, I, 
you don't think about yourself when you think you're dying or whatever, or there's a potential that you're going to die. You think about those people that you're going to be leaving in a, in difficult circumstances. And if if that and and if I get any sicker, this affects my son directly because he cares for me. You know, he lives here and he looks after me. So it's my responsibility to him to make sure that I don't get any sicker than I am now. It's amazing that really. It's amazing. I I do I know nothing, but I do know one thing, and I do say it to the listeners sometimes. I say, look the end of the week just don't obsess about this information and the things yeah. that are happening you do have to smell the flowers I think the artist I can never pronounce his surname David Vravnicek I think is his name he died in the 90s and before he died he was asked about leaving a message and he left a beautiful message for people you know his, his life was coming he was dying of AIDS before the um, um, anti-retroviral drugs or whatever they're called before those became available and he said a lovely thing. He said, smell the flowers while you can. And that means yeah. a lot to me, that. And I think about that sometimes coming to weekends, right? That's it. Forget about it. No more newspapers. No more television news. Go out with the person you love and smell the flowers. Spend time outdoors and don't think about this stuff because you have enough to do. And somebody like you who puts a lot of stuff online, you write your articles, you're well known. You're somebody that people... Look, look, you are somebody that people look up to to get some information from and for some guidance. You do have to take your time for yourself. There's no two ways about that. You've got to do that. Yeah. And of uh, you do. Well, you've learned that, obviously. I mean, you're older and wiser than I am, but you needed to, to learn that. So thank God it, uh, it wasn't any more Vinnie serious. Jones? Did you see Vinnie Jones in that interview with Piers Morgan? I read about it, but I didn't see him. But um, I believe oh, it was very God, powerful, that, was it? That was marvellous. That was more or less what he was saying. You've got to make the most of what you have. You really have. Because he so loved his wife and he lost her. And it's devastated him. It really has. And I, oh, I was in tears watching him. I don't know if I'll watch it, it then, yeah. What a lovely guy. Really, um, really lovely fella. I had the good fortune to, to, to meet him many moons ago. I'm not, oh, na- I'm not I'm name dropping. Just... Yeah, I'm not oh. name dropping. Yeah, I met him. It was when he made a film. I can't remember the name of the film. And I yeah, was, was asked... It, was it one of those East End Hard Man films? It, it wasn't. It was one he made in America. I think it was Gone in 60 Seconds. I think it was a remake of a car chase film. And I was given a job to go and meet him and do a very quick radio interview uh, with him. And I did and spent about an hour with him talking about oh. football. And uh, yeah, he was a really nice fella. Not at all this hard guy at all. Just a really down-to-earth guy. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able for that interview. Because when you love somebody, I mean, you loved your husband, and I don't want to make you emotional at all. You loved your husband. You described him, your description of him was was funny and loving at the same time. You, a big Scottish lump of muscle, you called him your husband. <laughs> but, the affection, <laughs> but the affection was in that. I could tell that. I don't want to contemplate not being with um, uh, the woman I love, so I don't necessarily think I'll watch the interview, but I I get the, uh, the the sentiments there. You know, we need to smell the flowers and realise that, you know, we can't change the world on our own. Uh, we can do positive things, but you do need to recharge your batteries as, as well. Francis, you are an amazing woman, you know that. It's great chatting with you. I lovely to speak to you as always. I love it when we have a little chat. Mind you, we never stick to the subject, do no, we? No, we don't, no. <laughs> I take the blame for that. I'm supposed to steer it in. In, uh, in in the right direction but yeah look we segued into interesting things do say hello to your son um, Francis and uh, look I know before Christmas we'll have you back on again I know we will I know we'll have you back on in the autumn so um, you're welcome back on any time and if people go to steam it to the website if you look for Francis Leader now Francis is spelled F-R-A-N-C-E-S like a godless uh, Philistine would spell Francis F R A N C E S, right? Some of my Catholic listeners might say. But uh, look, I love having you on. Thanks for doing it today and come back real soon. <laughs> Actually, the way I spell my name is the feminine. If it is the feminine. It is the feminine. Yeah, it is the feminine. Yeah, it's just the feminine of it. Anyway, uh, best, best of love to all your Catholic listeners and everybody else, especially yourself. Cheers, Francis. Bye for now. Thanks for your time today. Take care. Bye for now. The uh, the absolutely amazing Francis Leader live on the line. Well, I was introduced to Francis through Facebook a couple of years ago, and I was looking at this 
lady, um, I won't say, I won't give her age out, but Frances, um, yeah, she's she's older than I am. And uh, these terrific articles about fracking, but not about just about fracking, but about all the other subjects we talked about uh, today as well. Amazing lady. So yeah, um, we're coming up for, what are we now, 21 minutes or something past the hour. I better get out and get the programme on Podomatic and on YouTube as well. Francis Leader on Twitter. There's only one Francis Leader. Do follow her there. And thanks again to Caroline Stevens, uh, who was on the programme in the first hour as well. If you look for Caroline Stevens Seeking the Truth on YouTube, well, you'll find her channel. That's Caroline Stevens Seeking the Truth. You'll find her channel there. She's a remarkable person as well. Enjoy the programme today. Uh, the next time we'll speak will be on YouTube tomorrow morning when we look through the UK's morning newspapers. All right. Look after yourselves and one another. See you tomorrow. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.